there was a lot of insecurity. And and it's not like I, I, w- I don't think you'd meet me and think I was an insecure person. I would project confidence and security. But I was so insecure with that path, with building the company. It just felt like, man, I don't know if this is going to work out or not. That type of insecurity to the point that I was so scared to hear bad news, to hear this isn't working or that isn't working. And the biggest lesson that I take away from it is that if you want to become immune to to poison, you got to eat a little bit of it every day and go into it, you know, head first into that bad news. And that's how your product gets better. Your team gets better. You get better. And then you end up on the other side of a really healthy, informed ego of where you're good, where you're bad, where the company is good, where the company is struggling. And you end up with a pretty damn, you know, fortified immune system that can handle a lot. And I think in my 20s, I that was really tough for me. And, and I made the mistake over and over again, but the meta mistake of just feeling so insecure in our footing as as a company and as a founder, that it was like, let's go raise more money, let's get more validation, let's get better press, let's get more of these uh, milestones that sound really great instead of, no, let's spend this whole year going into headfirst into the areas that uh, are really struggling. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Powers, and I want to thank you for joining me on the Fort Podcast today. This show is an open-ended discussion and journey covering real estate, business, entrepreneurship, and investing. I would love to hear from you by tweeting me at Fort Worth Chris on Twitter. Hey guys, it's Chris. Thank you so much for joining me today. So pumped to have James Bashera, one of my best friends in the world and somebody that I've invested in over 40 early stage businesses with. We had him on uh, when I first started a few years ago and we're back. So we cover a lot of ground today. Uh, we talk a little bit about the fund that we're about to launch. We're about to raise a $20 million venture fund. We talk about his adventure through Silicon Valley and a company that he started that he sold to Airbnb. And the interesting part of the conversation is we talk about the not cool stuff, the stuff that you rarely hear about. And it's it's really deep and it's pretty awesome. We talk about just kind of being content and you know where we are now in our lives at, in our mid-30s and the things we've learned from our 20s to now. We talk about um, him being the third check into Clubhouse and a lot more. So thank you for continuing to join me on this journey, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. James, welcome back for episode three. I'm so excited to be recording with you today. Christopher, I'm excited to to chat with you every day that we get to chat. When you FaceTimed me earlier today, I think I actually told you verbatim, dude, my face lights up when uh, when I get a FaceTime from you. So I'm excited to chat with you as well. Yeah, dude, we've got a really cool relationship and we have for a while. And I actually want to kick it off. If you're listening to this, James and I met in 2004 or five. My roommate freshman year went to high school with James and James went to Wake Forest and we were at TCU and my roommate calls and says, yeah, my buddies from Wake Forest is going to come down and uh, stay with us for a couple days. We're going to have a lot of fun. And we did that and we spent like the entire like two or three days we spent pretty much inseparable the three of us um and james's yeah, last it was a, name it was a long weekend yeah so it was like it was a three no 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 i mean a three-day weekend <laughs> yeah um it was short and in memory because it did go by really quickly but yeah it was a three-day weekend every meal and i love we we're hanging out i was like man i'm i love this guy's energy we're right on the same wavelength and yep. uh yeah we, we loved hanging out we bonded over business, entrepreneurship. And again, this was our freshman year. So let's not pretend like we were that sophisticated yet. But James's last name is Bashara. And I guess when you're a freshman and you know, you're drinking for three days straight, you you don't kind of put it all together. So as he's leaving, we're kind of giving each other fist bumps and hugs, and he's leaving. And I'm like, Bashava. It's been an awesome three days. And the look that you gave me after devoting 72 hours of your life to our dorm room, and I couldn't even get the last name right. uh, I knew we'd be friends forever. And and here we are uh, 16 years later. 
I remember that so vividly. It was outside of the dorms, like in the parking lot. I was about to jump in the car and drive back to Dallas where my parents live. And, and it's like, okay, this is the parting moment. But I'm I'm looking at, at both of my friends, you and Clark, but uh, I'm looking at you. I'm like, man, we're going to be, I have a feeling I'm going to be friends with this Chris guy for a long time. And I was like, oh, and I think he knows it too. There's this, you know, one second extra pause uh, before <laughs> hug and goodbye. And you go, Bashava, man, let's stay in touch. Let's stay, let's stay in touch. And uh and kind of you were, you know, approaching two feet away for the hug. And I was like, wait, what? And then you <laughs> hugged me and I was like a dead fish. And I was like, fuck this guy. <laughs> I felt so and, guilty. No, nah, um, no, no. And then the, the, and then we hugged it out, but then we laughed. We've been laughing about it. Damn, that was fifth, that was almost 16 years ago. You know, the crazy part is like there wasn't really Facebook yet. There was no social media. I, like people were just starting to kind of text and call. You know, if that had happened today, you you kind of leave and you like go message them and text them. Hey, I'm so sorry. But back then you were able yeah. to kind of make that mistake. And you're like, I'm not even going to see this guy for like six months. He'll forget <laughs> about it by then. Um, yeah. Or the other or the alternative of like, <laughs> oh, well, I'm not going to ever talk to this guy again on purpose because yeah. he. Didn't even remember my name after three days. Yep. No, but that was, it was funny. And we've laughed about it like, you know, 10 times since, because it was such a funny uh, stutter start to our relationship. But it was, it, you know, what was more important obviously was within a few days, within a few hours, it was, we're on some type of similar wavelength and really enjoyed chatting with each other. And, and to this day, it, it's like I said uh, earlier today, just getting the FaceTime from you. And we FaceTime probably uh, these days, like every other day. But it was, uh, I was like, oh, sweet. I get to stop what I'm doing to do something better. Wherever this phone call goes, it's going to be with uh, my buddy Chris. And and uh, that's, uh, you know, I, I reflected on it on that call, reflected on it, you know, the top of this conversation, but it's it's really special. I, I I agree. And you kind of made a comment earlier when we were chatting and you were just kind of talking about how life is um, like a lot of the things that change your life or that set you off in different directions don't happen from like like this big planned conference or these agenda driven kind of conversations. A lot of things that happen in life happen off these kind of spontaneous chats. It's not that they happen every time. But we were kind of reminiscing on uh, the South Africa days, which we can riff on if you want. But just riff for a second on kind of what you meant by like how a lot of life happens in kind of these little microbites with unintended, you know, kind of agendas. But it sets you off in a different course. Yeah, I remember in college. So we're going back to college. I remember one of my roommates was watching this really cheesy Lifetime movie. And I think I was doing laundry or something. And I was walking in and out of the room and he was just in the living room and, and um, I hear the main character, this guy, main character, tell this female main character that lives are made on 12 seconds of courage. And, and I, and I was like, this is the cheesiest movie ever. <laughs> and yet, wait a second. I think there's something to that. And and I have no idea what the movie was, what the plot was, or anything. But I you know, walk into the laundry, and it kind of sticks with me. What what did they? What did he? I, I had to fill in the gaps of what did that char- main character mean by lives are made off of uh, twelve seconds of courage. And I compare that to and think about in business. There are these almost like surfing. There are waves that come your way that you could easily let pass, and and you really do have a very brief moment to to jump on a wave and it is not this thing that you can plan of like i'm going to go to this conference and okay these are the speakers and i'm going to find this person uh you know on on friday morning and i'm going to try to try to finagle my way to meet this person on on saturday and but it's it's far more important i think to be really open waiting listening and seeing a wave and and when you do see a wave come your way when you do see an opportunity come your way it really can be as as tiny, simple as 12 seconds in your mind. You say, okay, I'm going to do something about this opportunity that I could have never designed, but happens to be coming right in front of me. 
And this is one worth taking and, and shifting, you know, shifting priorities, shifting plans. And, and it's, it, that's, what's fun about t- chatting with you is you or I will bring, uh, each other or alert each other about a wave and, and whether that was investing in halo top or you investing in, in tilt and being the first check, um, you know, to get a check from one of your best friends for a business you're building that you're kind of, that you're, you're pretty uncertain about, or, and, and certainly the first check means that you're not getting much validation. You know, that, that's a pretty amazing lunch to go, to go to a, a, a best friend with and have them write a check and, and essentially give this massive nudge towards this business or that you want to build or me saying, Hey, we should invest in this cool company X, Y, or Z. It's really, or we should, you know, raise a, a venture fund or we should, um, honestly, it could be anything you bring, you bring waves of information that it's, I'm going to learn about whatever REITs or I'm going to learn about prop tech. Uh, or I'm going to learn about IRRs and just stuff that you know so much about that as a you know tech startup founder I might not know much about, and so yeah, answering that that FaceTime is fun because it's like oh some some wave might be coming through the phone call, and then it's my job to take that lifetime movie advice and say okay this is a wave worth worth jumping on, and almost like every time it's like if we have an agenda we do that through Loom where we can just talk about what we actually have planned to talk about. But like you said, almost every FaceTime is like, just like, it's not on the calendar. It happens some random time, like, hey, what are you doing today? And almost every time we leave the phone call with like, okay, very glad we talked about that and had no intention about talking about half of the stuff we talked about on that phone. And where that leads to, and we're gonna talk about Cat Empire later in the episode, but we talked about when we met and you talk about these, like you see a wave coming in 2000, was it 2010 or 2009? For South, South Africa? Yeah. yeah. It was 2008 to 2010. So in 2010, James and I were literally on AOL Instant Messenger, or maybe it was uh, like Gchat, doesn't matter, some online chat. And again, woke up that day, had no intention of going to South Africa, had no intention of talking to James, had no intention of like doing what's what I'm about to say. And we started chatting and I was like, how's the business? It's going great. Or, you know, this is what I'm working on. And I kind of said, hey, I'm working on this thing. I'm, I'm trying to start a real estate business where if we like lease a house to somebody, we might be able to donate. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. There's all these townships in South Africa. It'd be perfect. And then you were like, hey, you should just come to South Africa for a couple of weeks. And like an hour later, I forwarded you a copy of my plane ticket. I came down there for, I can't remember, like 10 days or two weeks or something. And it would have never happened had we chatted that day. And I would tell you, had I not made that trip, my life would be completely different. I would have never invested in Tilt, which means I probably wouldn't have gotten into venture investing, which means we probably wouldn't have done all the things that we've done. We've invested in over 40 companies together now. And had I not been at my desk that day at 10 o'clock a.m. on a Wednesday, I'm not saying we might, I might not have still come, but that one little moment like totally changed my right. life. And that, yeah, and that's, uh, it's unplannable. Um, and had you laid down plans, if you had planned the waves that you're going to take, then you're going to miss the ones that you should take. And, and that's, that is, I, literally just got done surfing. So that's maybe why it's on my mind, but it is it's such an integral part. It's also your know, one thing that I think a lot about is uh, in in startups, it's it's very Darwinian in the sense that that the theory of evolution from from Darwin, it favors a survival of the fittest. And we've kind of lost the original definition of fitness. We think fit fittest is strength, but it's it's uh, the original definition and what Darwin meant was that it was flexibility, adaptability. That adaptability was fitness, the ability to adapt. And that is so, uh, I found it so, I can only talk about my experience, but it is so integral in, in life or or when building things to be adaptable and, and adapt quickly and survival will favor 
those that can adapt quickly. And that was the case building a startup. That was the case, luckily, being able to sell it uh, to Airbnb. That was the case at Airbnb. The people that couldn't adapt, they just w- wouldn't ever find themselves in the room where brand new information has come in Tuesday at 2 p.m. We need to have a, a meeting about it at 5.30 p.m. on you know that Tuesday. And it's the four people that think really quickly, adapt really quickly, and get excited about, oh, okay, this is a different opportunity. This is not what we planned, but we need to make a call in the next you know, 24 hours if we seize this opportunity. That's the same for, certainly the same for investing or for you having that you know, G-chat and then saying, oh, I'm going to go down to, to South Africa you know, an hour later. That was so cool. I've mentioned that to you before. It's, it was, yeah, life-changing for both of us, um, but it was so cool for you to to have that time. There were so many, oh God, there's 30 friends, 50 friends that would say, oh, I want to come visit. I want to come visit. And you're the only one that just bought a ticket that quickly. Yep. Oh, to be single and and no kids. You could just fly across the world for two weeks unannounced. Um, If you're listening to this and you're single with no kids, take advantage of it. There's a lot that you can do in early in your career um, without having lives. Yeah. Lives are made on 12 seconds of courage. For sure. All right. You just talked about Airbnb. So James and I were in uh, Malibu together a few weeks ago. We spent kind of 48 hours. We just kind of planned a retreat. And the whole purpose was really just to catch up. Uh, We haven't seen each other since the pandemic. We've invested a lot together and um, we're both kind of at different parts in our lives. And we said like, maybe there's... By by the way, I don't don't know if we... uh, I hesitate to even put this on the podcast because I don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but did did your firm finish calculating our first 10 investments um, <laughs> The to see if we're any... I think we're good. I think we're good at investing. But yeah, I, I know that they were going to finish up yesterday or today. I'd love to know the number. And I'm and by the way, listeners can know that uh, same for my podcast, same for everywhere that I, I try to be online. It's going to be brutal, honest truth, no artificiality or posturing. Um, and so... I'm okay with sharing our first fund uh, metrics. Yeah, you are if you have them. So and we I can do. save we it. Just, we can save it. We can save it for later in the show or a different you know way no, to share it. But we can do it right I'm now. Um, so just to give a little background, let, let me just finish on that, and then I will get to what you just said. Was we went out and we said, look, it's been a year since we chatted. We had started communicating again more regularly. And we've invested uh, for eight years together. And James kind of approached me and said, like, I think we should do another fund together. And I said, great, but let's just like catch up and just see where each other's at and, you know, spend two days. We spent 48 hours just catching up. We probably talked for 20 hours straight. Just unbelievable, uh, fascinating opportunity. And so we had decided that we're going to raise a $20 million fund. And we've been working on it the last couple of months. And James was like, hey, by the way, I think we're going to need to show Fund One, which was our Cat Empire Fund One, which we can also talk about why we're called Cat Empire. That goes back to South Africa. And I said, yeah, we can do that. But, you know, it's kind of crazy the returns that I think we're going to get out of this one based on where we're at now. So if you're listening to this um, and you know anything about returns or investing, um, I want to just make a disclaimer. Venture is high. you know, a lot of these businesses don't have cash flow or they don't have like, they're not public. All you can really rate, all you can really calculate on is how much cash has been returned to date, aka exits of businesses or cash flow that businesses have distributed, and then public, uh, publicly available funding rounds. So what is the business valued at today with some public proof that it has reached a certain valuation? And so when we were doing this, James said, well, you know, some investors are starting to ask for kind of our fund metrics. Uh, Can you put this together? So I said, sure. So in fund one is Eden, YC-backed company, doing great things, a company called Eligible, a company called Gravitational, a company that's already exited called Halo Top, uh, basically um, uh, protein-based healthy ice cream, a company called Rig Up that just got renamed. And off the top of my head, I can't remember their new name. A company called Third Love that makes um, uh, like lingerie and bras and and women's kind of undergarments. A 
a company called Thunkable that was kind of no code before there was no code for building apps. A uh, YC back company called Triple Byte, a company called Tilt, and a company called Gusto, which uh, is basically like HR and payroll software for small businesses. And and RigUp's new name is uh, WorkRise. WorkRise, that's right. So if you look in those, uh, let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's ten companies. Uh, and you look at cash distributed date and then current valuation rounds. This is cool, by the way. I. Oh, I didn't plan on talking about, it, but this is this is cool to hear. And for listeners, we've been investing in eight years uh, over the last eight years as as technology investors and angel investors. And I have never had this this kind of uh, rigorous of a breakdown or or much of a, a process around the the metrics around it. Finding the companies is is where I kind of know I know my way around. But um, this this whole IRR, what does IRR stand? <laughs> <laughs> internal rate of return and, and rate of return right that that's that's a part of the world that i do not know a whole lot about that's why i'm here and i'm pretty good at business <laughs> development so we we split up we're 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 partners uh it's been the two of us we've done uh multiple funds together but this was our first and we invested all the capital in 2015 so we felt like there's a reasonable time horizon with which to kind of make judgments on so to date uh halo top sold uh, 14x, and we were able basically to return all of the fund's original capital based on that one investment. So everything else is still out there. Tilt sold to Airbnb. And then what's remaining in our portfolio is Gusto, which you invested at $60 million valuation. It's now a $3.8 billion valuation. Rig up, which we got in at $60 million, and it's now a $1.8 billion valuation. Third Love, which is a 20, we got in at $24 million valuation. It's now at 750 as of two years ago. So we don't really know where it is today. Eden, we got in at 5 million. Its latest valuation is 93. Triple Byte, we got in at 15. It's now at 75. And so James said, okay, well, what's a current IRR and current return on capital? And then we also projected five years out. So if everything sold today at its current valuations, which again is impossible, um, but it's it's basically how you have to to calculate. So current IRR over six year uh, currently would be sixty point three. Our return yes. on ca- yeah, our return on capital. This is this is gross. It's not net to the LP, but there's an eighty twenty. So we can do some quick math. Uh, is 18.66. So the fund will return 18 multiple, which again, we could do the splits, but but my fund, hand's in the air right now. Fund level, we're at 18.66. And then we said, okay, well, that's not happening. We think we can just like press a button and, and liquidate all these investments. So we ran it out for five more years, which would basically give us a 10-year fun life. It'd actually go to about 11 years. And we assumed that those valuations would grow at 10% a year for the next five years. Again, that's just hypothetical with venture. It's, it's just really tough. So we, we said, we'll do a 10% growth rate over the next five years. Where would we end up when it's all said and done after, an, after 11 years of holding? And that hypothetical would be a 37.3 IRR over 11 years, which is insane, and a 27.8 multiple on capital over 11 years. Again, when you put into four or 10 companies and four of them are unicorns um, and you've had really no losers, uh, that really helps. And so we're calculating returns on the four other funds that we've raised, or I'm sorry, three. That's, that is awesome. Okay, so I'm smiling kind of ear to ear because the 27x is is outrageous. The goal for the fund is three to five x, um, and that's typically the goal for for any venture fund. So that is outrageous. But I'm also smiling because going back to the the conversation at the top of the call, and by the way, I think our our subsequent funds will will do even better because we actually know what we're doing a little bit more. I'm smiling for a couple of reasons. One is going back to that kind of lives are made on 12 seconds of courage, you and taking the right wave, you were the one that called me and said, hey, uh, we should start, you're building out in Silicon Valley, gone through Y Combinator, and we don't, we don't have many friends. Or we don't have any friends from Texas that have, that have really done it, they, you know, moved out to Silicon Valley and gotten plugged in. And so you were the one smart enough to say, hey, you're 
kind of seeing this wave. And you, we could ride this if I raise the capital and we start investing. I had not thought about investing. I just thought, you know, just well, tell them what the you were doing. You, I know. You give them. I was building their... tilt. Yeah, yeah. I was bu- I was building out a um, my own company, a tech company, and um, and what is hilarious. What is also just part of the you know my podcast is called Below the Line, and everything about it, and it's similar to yours in that it's just just strip away all of the the bullshit uh, kind of uh, polished version of stories and tell the real stories of things. I'm smiling because you well one 27x, but then also <laughs> it's because that suck. But then you also are the reason that we started investing, and I didn't recognize this wave that was coming, and you did, and said uh, we should start investing, and I just hopped on board. There was one of those you know random phone calls that led to um, a very parallel but different career path of investing alongside building. I was building a company at the time. Didn't think I could do either well if I if I split my focus, but we only invested in, I think yeah, it was maybe 10, 15 companies um, over the course of two or three years. So it wasn't a huge, um, maybe it was a total of, of 50 hours of work over a few year period, but it was based off of, okay, I'm already, whatever the sport is, I'm already playing tennis all day long. I, I, I should be able to find which tennis players are really great because it's a sport I'm playing. So, you know, it, it built off of that, but it was a, but you, and same with you, you were, you had been a, a founder as longer than, than I had. And so it was a really good use of, of time. And so I'm smiling because I could have easily, I wanted to say no. Um, I didn't let you. And I think tried. I, yeah, I know. I think I did try to say no. Uh, so I'm really glad that you didn't let me in and uh, really glad that I said, okay, this is going to be another unknown to you know take on but I'm going to the other thing that's going through my mind is out of all those companies one uh has had a really you know bad return and it was my company tilt and I don't think it was related to the 50 hours put into angel investing but put into uh maybe equal parts many mistakes I have made as a founder over time and I'm I sadly had to admit, admit to myself like a year ago that maybe I'm a better investor than I am founder, but also startups, uh, they are the the riskiest venture class because they're just such high risk and high reward is that that's how you get to 27X, but it's also super high risk. It's kind of crazy. We've only had one that's uh, been underwater in the sale and that would be, and that would be tilt um, versus the nine others. Yeah. And I think the interesting part about all that is, um, and we're going to chat in depth about the tilt kind of story, but one, James was out there. I was single. I was flying out to San Francisco once a quarter. I tell people often, you know, I've been in real estate and in Fort Worth, and um, it's been an incredible journey, and I wouldn't change it for the world. But had I had a second life, I would have been in Silicon Valley with you. Um, I just happened to start a real estate company in college and didn't have really the luxury of, of moving. But tech has always been kind of my passion. And I learned how to raise money. And so James would send me these deals from like his Y Combinator buddies, like, hey, if you want to invest a little in here, and then it would like be really, it'd really quickly go by, or I didn't have the money at the time. And so, and then James was hyper focused on running Tilt. And so I basically had to convince him. I said, look, I'm going to raise all the money. I'm going to do all the paperwork. I'm going to manage investors. Literally, all you have to do at this point is when you see something really interesting that's getting a lot of traction, all you got to do is forward an email to me. Let me introduce the founder. I'll do all the due diligence. We'll talk about it. And that's kind of how we'll start. And you were finally like, all right, but you have to promise that it like cannot become part of my day-to-day routine. And I said, I promise it, it will not. I will handle everything. It ended up becoming something that we both love doing, but I had to convince you to do it. And I'm so glad I did. You know, again, fast forward eight years, here we are, you're angel investing full time. You've gotten into some of the most prolific companies that not just like we know, the world knows. Uh, you've learned way more about angel investing than I think you ever thought. And even though Tilt wasn't like the outcome we want, I'm going to, you know, you raised 70 million from tier one VCs. You got, you know, you grew a company with 100 plus people. It wasn't the, the outcome, but the experiences that you have 
and the you where the risk is and where things can go wrong, I think sets you up to be a better investor than somebody that just, you know, made it all the way, hit a home run and never really learned from anything downside. And so I think it's one of the most unique things that makes you qualified to to go into this type of life is that you know what the downside looks like and you know when to see it coming. And I kind of want to talk about that if you're ready to talk about it. Yeah, please. Uh, it There's no, there's nothing, uh, you know, nothing offsides. And, and it's, uh, I love talking about the things that, that have gone wrong because it, one, to your point, those are the experiences as, you know, Bill Gates has said numerous times, failure is the best teacher uh, and success doesn't teach you anything. I honestly think about that. I've learned so much on the founding side of things with investing. You s- I really don't know. I, I It would be very hard to describe what I've learned on the investing side of things because I still feel like, man, I just, I know that we hit the timing so well. I wouldn't know how to, you know, tell someone to, you know, make use of, of timing, you know, that's, uh, in advice, that's, that's something you can't advise someone on. We just got really lucky. Um, and, and feel like with angel investing, it's just every good deal. I'm like, man, I have no idea how that, how that happened. And, uh, but with, with founding companies, I, you know, got, uh, feel very fortunate to get, you know, a PhD in that, so to speak, because it was just brutal mistake, brutal learning after brutal learning. And it was like a you know 25 year career in, in five years. So do you want to talk about some of the mistakes or would you rather get into the story that we talked about while we were out in Malibu about actually selling the company to Airbnb and what that kind of all looked like? Well, if, if people want to hear about the mistakes, I've got an episode on failure and it's okay. called On Failure. Um, and so I think that that can be uh, if you just uh, look on below the line in your podcast app or YouTube, I do not want to take away. <laughs> you know, I don't want to advertise my podcast on yours. But, <laughs> okay, um, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, maybe uh, we could add the link to the episode in the show notes. And it's It'll it's something that uh, yeah, that goes into far deep, far greater detail than than I do even in a five minute story. But I will say that there was a lot of insecurity and. I don't think you'd meet me and think I was an insecure person. I would project confidence and security. But I was so insecure with that path that I, uh, with building the company, it just felt like, man, I don't know if this is going to work out or not. That type of insecurity to the point that I was so scared to hear bad news, to hear this isn't working or that isn't working. And the biggest lesson that I take away from it is that if you want to become immune to to poison you got to eat a little bit of it every day and go into it you know head first into that bad news and that's how your product gets better your team gets better you get better and then you end up on the other side of a really healthy informed ego of where you're good where you're bad where the company is good where the company is is uh struggling and you end up with a pretty damn you know fortified immune system that can handle a lot. And I think in my 20s, I, I, that was really tough for me. And, and I made the mistake over and over again, but the meta mistake of just feeling so insecure in our footing as, as a company and as a founder that it was like, let's go raise more money. Let's get more validation. Let's get better press. Let's get um, more of these uh, milestones that sound really great instead of, no, let's spend this whole year going into headfirst into the areas that uh, are really struggling and challenging. So that's uh, maybe the gist of it. And then every tactical mistake I, you know, that a founder, you just, you learn by doing, but that was the, that was kind of the uh, thematic mistake. It will be in the show notes. And I hi- actually, I really highly encourage everybody to check out below the line, his, his episode on failure, the way James like breaks down what failure is really like. And it was I'll never forget those days. We won't go into them to today, but he handled it gracefully and uh, it wasn't easy. He went from, in his own head, what felt like the top of the world to maybe the bottom of the world in a very quick amount of time and how you handled it, rebounded from it. And actually, like it's made you the person who you are today is, is super impressive. Um, and there's- and I, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I do, I'm so down to, to talk about the nitty gritty and um, the, 
no detail spared version of the acquisition and everything. But uh, but yeah, on on uh, building the company for five years, just to give listeners perspective, it was, it was we built it in about three years. Um, my co-founder and I had taken it to a, um, a $400 million valuation in three years from my bedroom in Dallas, Texas to the heart of Silicon Valley, best investors. And and then two years later, we'd be selling in a fire sale to Airbnb. And, and it was really painful looking in the eyes of employees that just had put their careers in your hands, investors that have put capital in your hands, um, and your own aspirations that you'd been working for six and seven days a week for five years, kind of just dissipating uh, between your your fingertips all in the, the last uh, three to four months, where four months prior was like, okay, this is still going to be a really, really good outcome. And then fast forward 120 days and you're like, what? the fuck just happened um that was kind of what it's like and yeah i talked about that uh, a little bit more in the that episode i mentioned dude it's insane and that's that's kind of silicon valley the it happens quick in both directions yeah okay we i want to just touch out one quick story um i just found it really interesting kind of off the piggyback of what we just talked about will you just kind of share those last few months you were looking to raise capital, maybe you weren't, then you were looking to sell and you were talking to American Express and Airbnb, and then it was just Airbnb. And then kind yep. of that discussion that you gave on like those last, that last day in the office where you just like ran in to like grab something and walked out for the final time. It's just kind of an interesting story. And we never get to hear that side of things. It's always the, you know, going to the moon stories that we hear, but this is, this is the real deal. Yeah. Throughout those five years, we had gotten acquisition offers here and there. Airbnb tried to acquire us twice. And we were just, I'll, I'll give you in the insight into my psychology was, uh, we're going big or we're going home. And so my co-founder and I knew that was the binary. I mean, I started a uh, the, the business in my bedroom in Dallas based on this is going to be, it, Tilt was built to be a social network for money. And, and I was like, what is an idea bigger than Facebook? Okay, it's going to be the social network around money, where you're, you are sending money back and forth between friends, between groups. You're able to participate in group commerce. You can crowdfund for a $50,000 cause you care about or a $1,500 party bus for your friend's 30th birthday and everything in between. And you could buy semi-Groupon-esque uh, deals from Yeti coolers all the way to uh, deals on tickets if you buy in the next three hours for a Texas Rangers baseball game and everything in between. It was And it was really cool to get these social notifications and built some great software around it. And we'd gotten these acquisition offers uh, along the way. And we were just like, nope, we're going big or going home, going big or going home. And it was su- payments are such a low margin business. You really do have to reach massive scale before these tiny little cents on each transaction add up. And and so it was um, that was our mentality from the get go. We started to get these points of validation through Y Combinator, through uh, Ron Conway investing as maybe the best angel investor of all time. And Andreessen Horowitz did our Series A. Then they did our Series B, which is really rare, maybe the best venture capital firm in, in the world. And, and uh, Mark Andreessen was a board observer and, and Jeff Jordan from and, uh, Andreessen Horowitz is our, was our board member. And uh, we also brought on a great board member, Chiwa Chen, who's, uh, he sourced the deal at Excel for Facebook. So it was like, man, from <laughs> I'm Mark you know, M Streets in Dallas. Yeah, from the M Streets in Dallas uh, to San Francisco and by way of Palo Alto and Y Combinator. We we're like, we are doing it. And I, I say that th- th- there's always two minds. There was always two voices. One was, we're doing it. And one was, we haven't built shit yet. And we could go out of business any day. And it really was both minds of going big or going home. And and both were, they were ever present and seemingly, they were seemingly inevitable, both of them at the same time in, in my head, at least. And so turn down these acquisition offers. Uh, Eventbrite is interested in acquiring us for a hundred million when we're like 16, 17 employees. And we're like, no, we're going big or going home. And then in the last year, in the beginning of 2016, the uh, technology sector dropped about 40% in 
in a six-week span. It was not looking good for everyone that was kind of hitting this drumbeat of there's a tech bubble, there's a tech bubble. 2016, we had raised uh, previously at 2014, and we were going to raise in 2016. Our board was talking about us raising at an $800 million valuation. And um, and that's what they said that we would likely uh, get. And, and we all felt good. Growth was great, but we had not built out enough of a revenue model on top of these kind of like Venmo that just is growing and growing and growing, but PayPal was subsidizing it uh, $90 million a year in 2016 and 2017. For us, it wasn't that it wasn't that much of a loss, but it was definitely was not a cash flow positive. And, and we were just focusing on grow, grow, grow. As they say, um, it's a land grab. So grab as much land as you can, then you till the land. And we we're kind of listening to that advice. Um, our board member who was, it was uh, uh, who ran PayPal coined that term, uh, grab the land, and then you till the land. And so we we were all kind of arm in arm doing this together and and growing about 5X year over year. And then uh, this January period happened. If anyone wants to look up LinkedIn's uh, stock price in January 2016, I think it dropped in a two-week span. It dropped something like 65, 70% in a two-week span. And this is what kind of sent shockwaves through uh, the capital markets for, for VC-backed startups. And it was looking like it was going to be really hard to raise, but we had about 12 months of cash left. So we thought we could be okay. Long story short, hit up 55 investors. All but two or three said no. No one wanted to lead our next financing round. And uh, and so I could tell it was going in that direction because we had raised 70 million to date, had, had a hefty valuation, but no um, revenue metrics. And it really did, you know, something that compared well to to Venmo in 2015, um, then Venmo became a, it was like the writing on the wall of, oh shit, that's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars to get to profitability. It was a terrible comparison in 2016. So with about four months of cash left, I go to dinner with, and I've never shared this on a podcast and not even on my own. So this is, I'm happy to, uh, you said no bullshit. to share this. Yeah, no bullshit. So I go to dinner with the Amex CEO, and this is a group dinner. This is like, there was 30 people at this dinner. And I'm like, I think I need to, I need to somehow spin this into a sale because we do have one term sheet, a inside round term sheet, which means that one of our board members is willing to fund the business for a smaller size check than what we're looking for. And we're going to have to pare down the business massively. And it was just so clear, this is going to be so expensive to continue to building out this, this payments network. Maybe we need to take a, a, a page out of PayPal or Venmo's playbook where you partner up with someone bigger. So Amex would be a great partner. So I used that dinner to spin up a, a process, but I also used that dinner um, that night, emailed that head of product at Airbnb and said, hey, just went to dinner with the CEO of Amex and they're interested in talking with us about acquisition. And it is, and I think at that point, interest was there, but, but uh, you know, I phrased it very honestly, but, you know, they were interested in talking to us about acquisition, but we would really love to end up, if we were to go down that road, end up in a place like Airbnb, which also factually correct. But, I conveniently left out there was 30 other people at the dinner and it was just this big, big ass group dinner with uh, Ken Chenault from Amex. So I then reach out to all others and it was that single dinner I was driving back from. It was a 45 minute drive that I decided I needed to do this. And so then my co-founder and I said, yep, this is the right move. It is just uh, maybe three years prior when we're only two years in, we'd be we'd have the energy five years in, six, seven days a week. We just felt like, okay, we put in not just a college try, we put in an Olympic try to make it to you know that gold medal standard and it's not looking like that's going to happen. So uh, without a couple hundred million and investors were not that keen to invest in it because like I said, Venmo was a terrible comparison of uh, basically even the public markets were saying, when will Venmo ever turn a profit for PayPal? Uh, PayPal owns Venmo. So that dinner then turns into, uh, and that drive back to San Francisco turns into spinning up process with a whole bunch of different potential acquirers. And, and fast forward to uh, the very end of this process, it's back to Amex and Airbnb. 
and Amex had a verbal offer uh, for us. And uh, it was for, I'm not going to spare any details, 110 million for the company. And I thought, okay, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good outcome. 12 days of cash left. They tell us two days later that they're pulling out of the process. We never learned exactly why. The back channel said that our user base was potentially too too collegiate, too young, which is laughable. Exactly who they needed. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what Amex four years later should have gone after. But they were deciding to build a social payments application, a payments application internally. And I think they just announced it was going to be launching soon, like a month ago. So four years later. (laughs) And um, an Airbnb who had offered 100, this is actually really interesting and how it played out. I don't know if I gave you this whole version of Malibu, but it's really uh, just, you can, you know, you control the process. You can never really control the results. And so Air, Amex pulled out at 110. They would have won the deal because the board uh, would have, we all would have said, okay, that's the higher offer. That's going to return more to investors and employees. And so we're going to go with that offer. We had raised 70 million. So it would have been an okay return on capital. Not, not what anyone wanted, but everybody would get their money back and, and then some. But then they pulled out of the deal, 12 days of cash left. And I was like, what the, f- okay, that sucks. But, uh, and don't, exactly know why, but now we're going to get to, we're going to get to take the deal from Airbnb. And so thought, all right, I, we'd rather work at Airbnb. So this is better. And Airbnb offered a hundred. Two days later, uh, two days after that, Airbnb called as they're putting the term sheet together and have the offer to 50 to 60 million. Somehow we have no idea to this day, uh, but at some point I would imagine it got back to them that the other suitor at the table bailed out and they had all the leverage, but still wanted to acquire the company. So they offered verbal terms of 50 to 60. We settled on 55 and they sent over the term sheet. I'll say when they said 50 to 60 on the phone call, we're in the conference room. It's Saturday. No one else in the office, in the conference room at our office. And they said, you know, we need to jump. Let's jump on the phone. They said, we're not going to be able to get to a hundred. After all, the best we can offer is going to be somewhere between 50 to 60. And I hung up the phone. I was like, well, then there is no deal hung up the phone. And I sat there. I was like, okay, I think I still have the control of the situation, but <laughs> uh, I might have just hung up on our only suitor. But out of principle, I was like, this, is, this isn't this is fully retrading, but it's it's damn near close. It's in the area code of retrading. And based on the verbal terms that we'd gotten two days before, and then luckily they you know called back and they're like, no, we want to make a deal happen. Uh, what happened? You know, the the uh, Brian Chesky got involved. How can we get this deal done? And Joe Zade, head of product, was like, let's jump on a phone call. Let's figure this out. Long story short, we ended up going to 55 million. And because they felt like they had all the leverage, they no longer needed to appease the investment capital and the investor side. They really just wanted the team to come over and, and build out social payments, split payments for Airbnb. It's about 56% of revenue for Airbnb comes from groups. And so that's why they wanted to acquire us from when we're two people. It's a massive part of their business. This group's traveling together and they want to be able to split payments. And they had tried to build it, I think, once or twice in-house. And, and it's uh, it's pretty difficult to build eight different credit cards from four countries and you know splitting a, a bill. And you know what happens if one of the credit cards doesn't work? And how do you hold the booking? All these, all these edge cases of the logic were needed to, to make the experience flawless. And we had done that pretty well at, at Tilt. So we signed the term sheet, but I'm, I'm just like, for weeks, I'm kind of like 50% is always two voices. One voice was, we're really lucky we found a buyer. And one voice was, what the hell happened? And it, it was just f- fall, catching a falling knife. Like what happened in this last, a uh, few weeks in the last 12 days. And and it was uh, the last year of the company. It was so uh, painful. And then telling every investor, this is what's happening after flying so high. And then, uh, you know, just um, thinking about just the, the entire team. They had to re-interview every team member to come over to Airbnb. About 30 team members came over out of our team of 70. At 12 months earlier, I had, uh, had to do layoffs of 30% of our staff. And so, we had uh, just over 60 team members and Airbnb required people to, to 
moved to San Francisco if they wanted to work at Airbnb. Uh, and it was just, just kind of like, wh- how did I end up in this uh, nightmare? And at the same time, I'm so lucky that we were able to find a home for the business. Yep. And then just riff a little bit on you, you make the deal and then you got to go obviously tell the team. Yeah. So make the deal. Were you sick to uh, your stomach? Sign it. Like the day you had to talk to him, were you nervous or were you? No, I, no, I, no, I'd already had countless days where I had to just put my emotion aside. And after we laid off uh, 30% of the staff going into the office every day, having already delivered that this is our fault, uh, this is our mistake and, and tried to uh, rebuild trust and us as leaders that you could follow us in this next you know chapter even though we've messed up before it was that was that was harder just going in and every day walking to my desk uh, putting on a game face when internally it just like man this is this is the beginning of of it going south and and uh, everybody's kind of everyone's so caring every i remember one person that we um that we had to Layoff just coming up to me to give me a hug the day that we, uh, the man, I get emotional just think about it. the day that we um, let them go. And she had this big poofy jacket on, and her name's Claire. And she just gave me this big hug. And, and I think that was, that was such a humane moment in the midst of building this business, caring so much about it, everyone, and then, and then telling. 30 people that they don't have a job anymore. Um, uh, it was that you love, um, that was just so she didn't have a job anymore. And she, that's the type of people that we were saying goodbye to that we had m- mishandled their, you know, their careers. And she's coming to give me a hug. Um, because it, everybody was so close. She, I think, on a certain level, she just knew this was, um, though I had a game face on, it was it was tearing me up. I think that probably instilled the resolve to where eight months, nine months later, when we're going through this, telling the team, it was like, yeah, this ain't the scenario. This is not the scenario any of us wanted to find ourselves in, but this is the reality. And we need to you know, own up to the reality and, and focus on the next steps rather than kind of get me getting caught up in, and been being sick to my stomach or anything. And so told the team, had everybody sit, we were all sitting in this uh, uh, cafe area and just said, I'd rehearsed it a handful of times and just said, we have some, some big news for the company and it's not all good news. Uh, the news is that we're being acquired by Airbnb and the bad news is that it's going to be uh, an aqua hire of, of the entire team, but everyone's going to have to uh, re-interview. And for those in, in our remote offices like Austin, you're going to have to move to San Francisco to be willing to move to San Francisco to uh, be a part of the Airbnb team. So people were kind of like, okay, awesome. We have, because we had been open about, we're trying to fundraise, we're trying to fundraise. It's not happening. We were also, I think for just the confidentiality, a confidentiality of, of our um, investors, I won't go into too much detail, but we thought we had a inside term sheet that didn't come to fruition. And so we, we thought we had an alternative that ultimately, even with paring down the team, it was going to be a fraction of what that inside round was supposed to look like. And so uh, that was communicated to us that it would look like. And so it was like, okay, we're going to have to pare this thing down to like five people. This more or less isn't an inside round offer we're going to have to sell. And so I think we had communicated maybe 70, 80% in this direction, but not 100% that we were going to have to sell and go through a, a really tough acquisition. So that was a big surprise for uh, the team, or at least maybe 50-50 surprise. But everybody that didn't join Airbnb was covering eight weeks of severance that we wouldn't have been able to pay anyone if we had pared it down to you know five people and kept going with, with this uh, tiny term sheet. But I'll tell you something. I'll, t- I'll tell you something interesting about it. It's um, you asked about the last day at the office. I remember I had to go in there to get certain things, like oh my, um, whatever my mouse is back at the office. I'm going to go get that. I think I 
got like a few potted plants from the office. And my last trip out was just like, okay, the handing over the keys, Airbnb was taking over the office. And so I'm going to go back in one last time about a few days before joining Airbnb. And it was all kind of everybody uh, from signing the paperwork, telling the team to joining was about a month. And so it was three or four weeks into that or three weeks into that. And, and uh, there was no sentimentality of, of that office. I think I was just like, more fires have happened in this office um, than, than structurally, you know, sentimentality, uh, you know, amazing things. More, more uh, the CEO job is just 17 fires for every celebrated victory. You can find other victories in each day. A meeting goes well and you feel good about it. But in terms of like really celebrating victory, it's 17 fires for each celebrated victory. And and you just know when you're celebrating this happened as a team, let's hit the gong and let's, you know, celebrate. You just know there's likely a fire that's going to present itself in 16 hours or that I'm already dealing with that I don't need to tell the whole team about. So it I just associated it with um just a lot of a lot of hard work, hard problems. And I was like, okay, I can put this chapter uh to rest, but I don't need to stay. I'm kind of like good riddance. It's the same when I make I make music on the side, it's the same when I make a song or I'm sure with podcast episodes with you. You just when you when you really like to create once a chapter closes on creation, you're just, I'm, I'm just like, I'm on to the next creation. Yep. Dude, thanks for sharing, man. Golly. Yeah. Anybody who's listening to this does not get to hear that very often. But the, the, the good part is it has set the tone for so many more positive things in your life. Getting to experience something like that, as shitty as it is in the moment, I'm not saying like you're lucky or you're fortunate, but you have an experience uh, that, 99.9% of people don't have and it's a foundation to build on. If you look at like if you look at it that way, if you look at it as like I'm going to let it haunt me the rest of my life, well then it will, but um the things we'll talk about kind of for the rest of the podcast, I think it teed you up very nicely for what you're working on now and um Oh, it is it is the gr- I I see I know friends, I know that you know friends that that their first ambitious for is a success and then they they really do not know they really think it's all of them and not the market, not the timing, not the wave. And, and they actually have crunched the numbers on, on startup successes and failures. And the biggest predictor is, is market timing, not capital, not team, um, but market timing. And, and, and the others are very important. But when you fail, you, you, you never take away, oh, we were, it was the wrong time. You definitely get to learn the other surface area of the equation of, Okay, what could I have done better? What did I really royally screw up? What would I do differently? And um, but at the same time, I also look at it. and It's like my co-founder Kayla and I both feel like, wow, that was that was an invaluable twenty-five year career in a five-year span of of learning all these things. And and yeah, I'm, all of my twenties was just kind of felt like failure after failure. And four years into into my thirties, it's it to exactly what you just said, there is not a single iota of doubt in my mind that the next 50 years, if if we're lucky to, to do well in, in different uh, ventures and choices in our career, I will, I will continually look back and not take for granted all of that failure, all of that experience and learning you know, in the field that, that contributes to the decisions afterward. For sure. Um... I just want to ask a couple questions. We don't have to go long on this, but you got to sell your business to like arguably one of the greatest companies in the world now, which even at the time when you sold to them, they were still a, you know, five, ten billion dollar company. They were lighting the world on fire. No, they were actually going, they were going in the shithole and then I saved them. Yeah. They acquired us <laughs> and we turned it around. Buy our payments company Stand- that you won't use and we'll <laughs> save you. Yeah, the, and for our listeners, the, so six months in, um, they disbanded the team. We built a first version. Like this is good enough. Now, James, we need you to lead um, other lines of business, and that was arguably very cool to build out new business lines. But 
Um, that's how acquisitions go sometimes. You have this marriage and this mutual future you're excited about, and then things change and you have to adapt. I didn't think it was going to be six months in there. They were like, okay, we have this other strategy <laughs> and James, we need you to go and, and do it. But, um, but it was unexpected, but I was so used to it. That took me like probably two weeks to wrap my head around because they had spent 55 million to buy our business. And then six months in, they were like, okay, this is good enough. Now let's go do something else. But, but then a year later, yeah, I think a year later, they ended up just taking the solution out because it, um, it was too costly to maintain this split payments feature. And, and it only had that version 0.5. It wasn't even the, you know, real 1.0 version we aim to uh, implement with our, our team and our technology. So it like a year and a half in, it was, there was like nothing to show for it other than, uh, I guess the acquisition, uh, price and, and it was something interesting there though, that I did not understand at the time. Um, that was a blessing in disguise was because uh, Amex had backed out, they decided to make basically their whole offer in uh, stock. And I think I told you this part. And because they made mm -hmm. it, it was like 10 million in cash or 12 million in cash, the rest of the 55 in stock, because it was that uh, dynamics st stock for the team instead of the previous 100 uh, was going to be uh, 70 million in cash, 30 million in stock. It ended up being actually more stock. And uh, the company then goes went public two months ago at uh, at a valuation that uh, was about three x uh, bigger, and so just on that stock alone, it ended up being it actually it, that ended up exceeding um, the original stock price and greatly exceeded it because for the team because it was um, stock more stock going to the team, so it's it's very funny how it works out with uh with you know being acquired by a company that is still growing and owning stock in that company everything that beat the amex reason. offer For yeah like, that's it work at the company we wanted to work at and it beat the amex offer when it was all said and done it just would not would have never foreseen that so most people have never been in a private company like pre-ipo they get to see it go public like how does that work from your side they just does somebody from Airbnb or some bank call you and say, hey, by the way, here's all your shares and we're about to go public and we're just going to dump a bunch of stock in your account in a couple of days. Yeah, like, how does that actually so, happen? Yes, it is so wild, but it's so wild because of how unceremonious it is. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> here's your email. Airbnb alumni, here's your email for your login to Fidelity. Log in and I never used, I never. Oh, they make you traded. use Fidelity or is that what you were already uh -huh. using? They may, no, they make you use Fidelity and Got it. and they have like a portal for Airbnb, uh, current employees, Airbnb alumni. And I remember like logging in and being like, oh, this is so clunky. I've never, I've never traded public uh, equities really. And certainly not on Fidelity. And so I was like, this is so strange. It feels like there's going to be bugs. The software looks terrible. Um, but log in and, just says, this is where, there's like a little overview video. And they're like, this is where your shares will show up. Um, and then IPO day rolls around. And and the day before, DoorDash had gone public. And it was like, it was like a $70 billion valuation. It's like, damn, I'm hoping for Airbnb to be at 30. Maybe if, if we're really lucky, it'll be at 45 is what people are uh, hoping for. And then it ended up going public because DoorDash had gone public for 70. I was like, that, that company ain't worth $70 billion. So <laughs> Airbnb is, it, it really genuinely is uh, a uh, behemoth in the making, making about a billion in revenue and net revenue. So I was like, this is uh, and nearing profitability. I was like, they're going to be, this is going to be a juggernaut, maybe 50 billion. And then it ended up going public at a hundred billion and, um, hundred billion dollar valuation and and I just see my fidelity account an hour into it just shows the dollar value of the shares and it's like okay that's just how pretty works. Uh, yeah pretty interesting and it, I mean that was from my bedroom in Dallas to there all told it was nine years or so um so you know averaged out year over year you know, maybe could have made more going into investment banking, but certainly would not have learned as much. And, 
and it was interesting to see to see that you know amount on a little computer Dude, actu- screen. Actual dollars. Uh, maybe you could have made more, but value and inherent knowledge and wisdom and the ability for you to earn for the next 40 years, you are infinitely in a better space than you would have been having going to Silicon or New York and just sludging behind some investment bank. Um, thousand percent. I, I, I think um, creating in any form, whether it's gardening, cooking, or building a business, is God's work. Like if we're made in God's image, we are made to create and and not creating or writing someone else's story. Maybe that's it. apprenticeship is is valuable, but I think everybody needs to become the author of their own story so that they really can be at the tip of the spear learning how the universe works and not, you know, and not sitting on your couch wishing you were the person that was doing X, Y, or Z or, you know, uh, watching big waves surfing and never actually going out there and experiencing what it's like. You don't, you don't gain anything by, um, you, literally, you do not gain anything by listening to this podcast episode versus what, what you learn by doing. And, and then where I think these are valuable is when you are in the midst of, you're in the trenches of creating, of building, and you're just like, why is this not fucking going this, the way that I thought it was going to go? Um, the benefit of these conversations is that you can you can kind of hear what they're really what it's really like and it's not this you know straight up into the right perfectly polished amazing journey it's actually it's a lot of ups and downs um uh, and and a lot more downs than than ups um so keep going keep creating cuz it's whatever you're going through it i can confidently say this whatever you are going through right now listener listening to this podcast episode, whatever you're going through, if you are creating and it's not going the way that you thought it would go based on what you read about this company or that company, keep going. That version of the story is bullshit. And what you are learning to what Chris just said is going to be, whether it pans out or doesn't, it's going to be so foundational to the success that you ultimately will have. And and more than that, the wisdom of how the world works on the other side. Dude, I love it. Throw just a little bit of highlight. Let's let's prop up Mr. Chesky right now. Like the five billion that he or ten billion that he has hasn't propped him up. But you got to work alongside like one of the greatest uh, CEOs of the last ten years. Built an incredible company. Is there anything off the top of your head that comes to mind where, where you literally got to interact with him on a day to day basis? Like what um what was it like he's, to work with him? He's the he is the real. Deal, and I knew that before we joined. It's one of the biggest reasons I wanted to join Airbnb is because he had uh, the Airbnb team had kind of taken us under their wing uh, right when we got to Silicon Valley. Paul Graham at at Y Combinator introduced us uh, maybe in the first day that w- two days that we were in in the Bay Area. Uh, said you need to meet this team, and and they're in the current batch of of YC, and so we were they were really gracious to to chat. We loved all of our interactions with them and and I loved the interactions with Brian and and so it it really was a it was we wanted to land the the plane at Airbnb if we could and he the biggest thing that he impressed me with is that he is someone that will just head first eat whatever poison needs to be eaten that guy will not shy away from something that isn't going well he does not just spin it as like or what wor- what's worse is you know to have a disease and not know it and ignore it um that's worse than having the disease the second he realizes there's a disease he's like, that's what he's going to be talking about all hands with the whole team with the whole company um four people in the room uh, just it's it, it doesn't matter the audience he is not reframing and he's not glossing over it but worse but best of all he's never ignoring issues that are happening. And that is so rare. It is so rare, especially I got to see him day in, day out in years. I don't know. They were almost eight years in. And so you, you'd think someone was really, really tired and, and run down by all the things that go wrong, especially when you got 5,000 employees and, and, uh, then 7,000, then 10,000, but, uh, so much energy and energy in 
always pointed in the right direction on the current hill that needs to be climbed and not some easy slope to uh, to something that's you know temporary but it's gonna feel good it's uh, that was always the most impressive piece like I, anyone would have been like oh well let's yeah that's bad but um look what's happening that's great over here and it was just like no this is bad and this needs to be fixed this is my uh highest my highest priority and you and the team uh, i'm going to be working with you shoulder to shoulder and we're going to we're going to fix this and it was uh even the things that didn't reflect maybe uh too well on him as a as a leader for this chapter or this you know moment in time in the company it was just such a dedication of like i mean he would he would just say that does not reflect well on on us as a leadership team and me as a CEO and I need to do a lot better here. So I'm taking in this feedback and and we're going to do better. And that's just yeah, it was awesome. That's so awesome. And and I, and this doesn't have to be for Brian per se, but you've been in this world long enough. When somebody is emerging like Brian that starts at like this, you know, small little fledgling startup and and in 8 years goes from like three employees to 20 to a hundred to a thousand to 10,000. How does it work? Like, does he get in? And and maybe we don't have to talk about Brian per se, but you've seen enough of these. You have enough friends that have had these kind of meteoric rises. Do they get like executive coaches? Like who is teaching them to elevate along the way? And do the VCs mandate that they do that? Or is it just self-select? Well, the best self-select um, if a VC is mandating it or suggesting it, yeah, it's not a good sign. But um, the best are, you know, they're, they're they're masters. They want to be masters of their craft, and so they want to find out where those shortcomings are, and and they want a coach. I mean, you know, the best. It doesn't matter how good you are at golf; you still have a coach. Um, you know that yep. uh, better better than anyone. It's it does not. Um, as a great golfer and you know fan of the best golfers, you, it's that that was always interesting to me to to know that. I, I I guess I figured great basketball players had coaches, but it's always more prominent with you know Tiger Woods has a coach, and and that's for all of the obvious reasons. And yet that whole larger point was not obvious to me until I started to pay attention to the people that were the best at at what they did in the world. So Brian has a coach. I think he might have one or two different coaches. Um, every executive has a coach at Airbnb. I think what is interesting about Silicon Valley is that there is this emphasis placed on right now is so different than anything that's come before that you have to be hyper aware. That's the whole opportunity is to find some avenue that has never been possible before. Um, and you're building technology towards that, which means that you really cannot copy and paste how anyone has ever done it uh, before. You can't read how Amazon did something 10 years before. You can't read how Apple did something uh, five years before. Every company, every anomalous company is anomalous in their own way. And so you all have to just have this. You, it, it forces you to have the best CEOs, this, um, this highly emphasized, hyper awareness of what trends are happening what's happening within the company what's happening without the co- you know outside the company what where are my shortcomings come where are my shortcomings no one has built anything like this at this time before so i need as much help as i can get um i mean there are coaches and then there's probably a 17 to 20 person rotating board of advisors that brian is is tapping into at all times. So it's, it's, uh, there's the benefit is of being in uncharted territory is that you really get to embrace, okay, shit, we're in uncharted territory and, and there is no manual for this. So I need to piecemeal together as much great advice from great thinkers as I possibly can, because it ain't going to be, it ain't going to be me that figures out this is exactly what needs to be done. And, and the world is just moving so quick that even advice from five or 10 years ago in a world today is like it might even not even be relevant with the amount of resources and technology and software that exists, you know, year after year. Yeah, I, re- I remember 
I remember hearing a story about Mark Zuckerberg when I was just getting started and I was so like in the mindset of, of let's dominate the world, let's build something bigger than Facebook. And, and so let's, uh, it's not a great way of building a company. It's a terrible way of building a company to concept a company. I, I like to think that they really should be like pulling on strings of a problem you have, pulling on threads rather than sitting and concepting. Um, it's, it's not just conceiving, but it's like, I want to make sure this concept is massive so that it's going to impress so-and-so and so-and-so. And so what I tell them about, it, it's going to be bigger. Than, it's such an ego engineering exercise. Uh, but I would you know, consume everything I could about Facebook. And one thing that I remember learning was that Mark Zuckerberg uh, was uh, well-known for just saying, what is, for asking in every conversation, what is that? What do you mean by that? What what does that mean? What does that acronym mean? Um, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me more about it? And that was so, it's, it's in high contrast to the stories we have of people that are brilliant um, have all the answers. creators. Yeah, that ha- that you think have all the answers. And, and it's the reality is the opposite. They're insatiably going into territory that they really don't have any answers and they're chatting with those people. And, and that is, I remember hearing that while I was still in Texas and, and really employed that with everything that I was doing, uh, where I would just unabashedly say, I don't know what that is. Um, I mean, three weeks ago, I was like, I keep getting asked what the IRR is and I know what it is conceptually, but what the hell, what is that powers? And, uh, and there's just, there's the tendency to act like you have no weaknesses. Um, is I think that really um, that shields you from so much insight and information that could be shared. And and it's just so much more impressive when founders use those three insanely powerful words, I don't know, than a pitch where they act like they know everything. And and my eyes gloss over when a founder acts like they know everything. It's like, oh shit, this person is going to be terrible to work alongside. Vulnerability is a strength. And it's taken me so long to learn that. And I still fail at it all the time. Um, My natural tendency is not to be super Mm -hmm. vulnerable. uh, But every time I've been vulnerable in my life, it seems like it doors uh, open up. And you relieve when you are having to like, not fake it, but like pretend like you know everything that stresses you out and you leave me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's not like you're lying because it's not like you're intentionally trying to deceive somebody it's just natural instinct is like i'm a ceo i need to be the smartest guy in the room and like you and then you hear stories about what you just said is like no the best people if you really get to know the story were were the people that were the most curious that didn't necessarily know the most in the room but knew what to do with what they learned along the way um and it's just something that's taken me so long to even just wake up and say like my job, if I am the smartest guy in the room, we are failing uh, right. as a company. Um, so, no, it's, and, and and these stories that we get told, they're so they rob us of so much courage, creativity, um, and innovation because we're told these stories of what these leaders are like, and it is total bullshit. And then you get real up close, and you find out the truth. And you're like, Steve Jobs didn't have an answer for everything. Um, there's a there's a, a guest that I had on recently, the founder of of Goodby Silverstein Partners, one of the biggest ad agencies in the world, and and his name's Jeff Goodby. He's a, he's responsible for like the Got Milk ad campaigns. They had five Super Bowl commercials this year. I mean, just outrageously successful ad icon. And he said, uh, he was telling me this story about Steve Jobs. And he said, in private pitches, Steve would tell you. <laughs> We're fucked. <laughs> our, our, you know, here's a graph of where the business is going. When he, when he took over Apple, he was like, here's where the business is going. And I'm worried. We are not going to be around if we do not make a, uh, you know, XYZ correction ASAP. And, and yet the public persona of Steve Jobs was invincible. This is the product that's going to change the world. And that is the persona that is the, the perfectly, a uh, polished version of a story that that a product a company wants you to to believe um, is going to you know put out in that magazine article if they can you know PR engineer a great magazine article but it is 
so far from the actual truth. Steve Jobs was, he was famous for just being quiet and asking and asking and asking. In executive meetings, it was like this uh, running joke that you could never tell what Steve was thinking because he wouldn't offer, he was just quiet, absorbing information. And then sometimes um, bursting out with uh, the occasional, that's, that is shit. Um, that is terrible. But even then, you didn't know what he was really thinking because I've just learned from his former chief of staff, from uh, that story from Jeff Goodby. Like it was, it, you never really knew because maybe it was just, uh, maybe it was just a, a nudge to get you in the right direction, but he was already impressed. And that is, um, that private version just blew me away when I heard that from, from Jeff Goodby telling me that story where he's basically saying, showing a graph of where the business is going, why they have to make these drastic moves, and and essentially pitching um, the ad agencies to come on, but telling them the absolute truth, saying, if you join, this is the challenge we have in front of us. Um, or Mark Zuckerberg, worth $100 billion and not going around acting like he knows the answer to to everything, but but doing the opposite. And that is, you know, that's, the real version of a great creator, a great CEO, a great founder, not the one I, I know when I led Tilt and thought that I had all the answers, that was just, I really robbed the entire team of the opportunity to subsume, to subsume these gaps in knowledge and, and really be the heroes because I felt like if I'm not the hero solving this or that, then, then I'm this young 26 year old CEO, 27 year old CEO. I, I won't have the, the credibility of, of being at the helm of this company, unless I'm the superhero, and it's so freaking wrong. And the truth is, all the people that do make superhero status in the media, like 99% of them don't want to be superheroes either. They just get thrown into the mix, and like that's undue pressure. Nobody starts a company to become a superhero. It, well, I, you know, many, I, I started Tilt because I, I wanted to become, I would talk about the mission all day long, but it's that even that is just bullshit. There was ego engineering in there as well. And uh, that was probably 50-50. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, I worked in the nonprofit realm and, and studied development economics. I was pretty impact driven. And yet still I was, I felt very uh, confident. This will be a short, this is going to be a shortcut to building up the self-image. And it turns out building companies self-annihilating. One uh, thing that uh, I always found interesting when I would visit you, which it's, it's, and I'm not saying it's a Silicon Valley thing. Like, look, there's greatness that comes out of Silicon Valley. It's more just like the culture of the tech world. As I remember, I'd come visit you and um, it wasn't just you that maybe like, it's not you were trying to be egotistical. It's just part of what you get like swallowed up in. But it's not just the founders either. It's like you, everybody I would meet when we'd go to dinners or like go throw frisbee at the park or go on like the Halloween boat cruise, you ask people like, hey, what's your name? And they're like, hey, I'm like Todd. Oh, it's cool, Todd. What do you do? It's like, oh, I'm number 22 at Zillow. Like if you're in the top X amount of like everybody who's in the, like if you come to Texas, like nobody is telling you what number employee they are at their company. Um, right. But it's kind of this world that you get, you know, put on. And I think that's what happens when you're turbocharging businesses and feeding them millions or billions of dollars and saying, you got to get to the moon in three years or this ain't going to work. Yeah, it's it's basically, especially, it's almost like insecurity compounded on insecurity, compounded on insecurity. It is the most insecure, it's the most insecure play. I mean this in a deep way, but it is the most insecure uh, way to build a business. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it, you, your footing is never secure. You're basically, if you're going to build a software business that has low margins or or any software business to to begin with, um, it is. In three years, we'll find out if we have something. It's going to be a <laughs> long ass time of just building, building, building. To uh, you know the the venture stat rates, one out of ten is going to be something special. Nine out of ten won't. So you know that going in, and then you add in a very insecure time in your life of um, 20-somethings, adding in a very insecure time in the world of feeling like, wow, there's all these stories of these people just like me a few blocks away building these, these 
transgenerational, you know, wealth accumulation in five years and they made a billion dollars. And it's just a recipe for everyone feeling really insecure. And I know that I include myself in that, in that bucket. It's, I, I, I often think about just like, if you have world domination in your, in your, in your sights, I almost want to sit you down and say, tell me about the trauma in your life that has caused this, uh, yeah. this world domination um, style of ambition. And, and it's not just, I mean, it's the world we're living in today. It's a very individualistic uh, world now. And it is. And, and I think it's, it is, uh, at the end of the day, we're all walking around, walking down the street saying to everyone we see, please love me. When in reality, it's like love and happiness is like when you're content and it's hard to be content in a world when you can look at your phone a hundred times a day and see somebody else doing something quote unquote better than you. Whereas like 30 years ago, you like woke up and went to work and you're like, you saw like one or two things throughout the day that might've been something you were envious of. And now you wake up and if you get on your phone while you're in bed, like in the first two minutes of your day, you can already start like being envious and, um, right. I, yeah. I how do remember. you, how do you, how do you, I know that you do some unique things just to uh, curb that and keep a, a nutritional, you know, feed of information into your, your head. What are some of the things that you do? Well, I will tell you that, but I wanted to read one quote real quick on, uh, Charlie Munger's quote on envy. Yeah. Charlie talks about envy and he says, envy is a really stupid sin because it's the only one you could never possibly have any fun at. There's a lot of pain and no fun. Why would you want to get on that trolley? Like there is no, like, there's a lot of sins that you can do that are a lot of fun. And that's why you do them. Envy is one of the only ones that like, there's only downside. There's no upside. Right. Um, but yeah. we live in a world where envy sells. That's why people are trying to look fitter and there's plastic surgery is like more rampant than it's ever been. And, you know, everybody's yeah, trying to one up everybody. That, that word is not near, that is the, the fuel of Silicon Valley and the, it, it's the fuel of, of many industries. It's the um, fuel of the world. You, it is. Yeah, it is the fuel of the world in many ways. I think it's, it's such a powerful quote because it, it is so self-destructive. Um, it's, uh, there's, you know, a similar quote of, of envy being an arrow that you shooteth at others, uh, but um, hurteth thyself. And it's, it is so, yeah, it's toxic too. It's a, it's a mind virus and it's never satiated. I, I live in LA now and it's, I'm sure it's a similar vein of, of um, insecurity driving people from St. Louis all the way. All, like if, if you want to look at, at the, one way of looking at the travails and distance traveled by someone in their career, you could also kind of look at it in the sense of, well, that's how discontent they were with where they started. And, and you know, if you're moving from Dallas, Texas to Silicon Valley, there was a real discontent to, with, you know, the current life of, and my ambitions, but really, you know, what a, I wanted to impact the world, but I want to underscore again, it was this ego engineering. And that's such a shitty way to start a business. One, because like the envy being an arrow shot elsewhere and, and comes back and hurts yourself. It is that desire to start something for, you know, this very well too. If you think you're going to engineer uh, your ego out of building a, a business, it's, it is far more likely that it's going to annihilate your ego all along the way, which every step is a step towards enlightenment. So go for it because it's going to be, that's, that is uh, profound in its own right, but it certainly won't be this thing that, uh, wow, my own boss and everybody works for me. And, and I don't know, I get to do whatever I want and I'm on the cover of this magazine. Um, that is even those people, they're getting dragged through the mud that ego is being, um, is being disassembled six months later, and uh, and there is there is no there is no perch you sit upon, feeling like wow, I'm content now, I've made it, and I'm untouchable. You nailed it. I mean, the constant if it just relates to the entrepreneurial journey is like these fictitious milestones that you need to arrive to, and you constantly think that oh, once I arrive there, everything is good. 
And the only way that's truly possible is if when you arrive there, you're content with where you're at. And just by nature, right. growth is, uh, you used to say this, growth and comfort don't coexist because businesses yeah. are built to grow. And if you're growing, there has to be like this sense of envy, I guess you would call it, or this sense of like, I'm not doing enough, I need to do more. And so there's this fine balance of how do you ever, how are you ever truly content? And the answer is there is ways, um, but it's very hard to see them, especially when you're young and haven't had a lot of life experience. Like I'm relatively young, I'm 34, but after doing this for 17 years, I feel like I have some battle wounds and scars. And I know I'll laugh at myself five years from now thinking that I have figured anything out, anything out right now, but I have figured out enough to go like everything I desired even like five or 10 years ago is such a myth. If I make a billion dollars one day, great. Are there's, is mm-hmm. there a chance it happens? Sure. Am I going to design my whole life around making it happen? Fuck no. And I used to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my my favorite philosopher is this guy Alan Watts that I I've probably told you about over the years, and and he's famous for in the forties, fifties, and sixties bringing Eastern philosophy into the West, and um, essentially translating Zen, Buddhism, Hinduism for Western audience. And Eastern philosophy is really healthy for starting a business, and it's a they're healthy in the in the sense that. There's a, a Zen quote I think about all the time that, that goes, the only Zen you find on mountaintops is the Zen you bring up there with you. And that is so true about this external pursuit that you might be in the middle of. You feel like it's going to give you Zen. It's going to give you release or liberation or, or uh, contentment. And, and it doesn't. It never, it never does. It is only an internal uh, pursuit that, that can give you that. And and it's also one of the one of the things that uh, that he talks about uh, ad nauseum is is around the concept of letting go and moving with nature, and that's such a different. The West uh, and and I think in many ways, um, Western philosophies, uh, Christianity even is about conquering, is about. Being uh, on the believing, you know, having right belief, right action to ultimately get to this external place of heaven that is pure bliss. And it really is a hemispheric philosophical approach of the external infinite. And what I love about Eastern uh, philosophy, specifically a uh, philosophy that, that influenced Alan Watts called Vedanta, um, is which it sits kind of at 5,000-year-old ancient uh, philosophy. It's very simple. It's not a religion. It's just a, a philosophical viewpoint. And it's an interior infinite pursuit that whatever you're looking for, um, it is within you and not some milestone, some career checkbox, uh, some bank account number. It is. Uh, it really is an internal pursuit. And that's uh, that has shifted my thinking in my thirties. What does an internal from, pursuit mean? That it's it that z- you better bring that zen to the mountaintop that you're traveling to because you're not yeah. going to find anything up there. Got and it. and if you if you find yourself on the tops of mountains, feeling like it's not okay. Now I got to climb the next one. Now I got to climb the next one. That desire for that external pursuit is bondage. Is Imprisonment, as Naval Ravikant likes to say, desire is a contract you've made with yourself to be unhappy until you get that thing. And and that desire, that external desire is this contract that you're just with yourself that, okay, I'm going to be unhappy and, until I get that. And it's fine to make that contract, but you better realize you've made that contract. Um, and I think to take it further, when you do get that thing, if you find yourself 34 years in, 35 years in, 25 years in, you're like, okay, I've gotten all these other things that I pursued. I'm pretty damn efficient at getting these things that I pursued. And none of them, it's always the next hill. It's always the next hill. Then then maybe it's worth sitting down and saying, is it the next hill? Or is it something within me that is worth that is worth looking at? Alan Watts loves to say that it's, um, we don't know what we want. 
and we don't know what we want for two reasons. Like you listening to this, spend five minutes putting 150 words down on a piece of paper describing what you want in life. Not three words, not five words, I want to be happy, but 150 words, write down exactly with specificity what you want in life. And within five minutes, I can prove to you, you do not know what the hell you want. And and it's, it's just a fascinating concept just to realize, oh, I don't know what I want. And and he would he goes on to say you don't know what you want for two reasons. One is um, this idea that there is this static you. You said you know what you wanted five years ago versus now that you know we're changing every ten years. We're totally different people, which means every five years we're totally different people. To exactly what you just said, I know that I'm totally different. I'm gonna be totally different. I'm gonna cringe when I listen to this podcast episode in five years because I'll be like, man, you really had no fucking clue what you're talking about, and and we should. Because we should we should be growing, and that that's a uh, that's a good direction to look back and say you did know, and maybe you know a little bit more now. But if we're changing every five years, we're changing every one. If we're changing every one every year, we're changing every five minutes. So this idea that it's like when I was twelve, I knew what I wanted is laughably ridiculous because we change so often, and so we don't know what we want because there is no static me to want this thing when I'm forty. That then. Six years later, I get, and then I'm like, oh, wait, but now I just want this other thing, this other thing. And so um, it's kind of the first step of of internal reflection is, is saying, okay, what do I want? And then if it turns out, you know, in your case, you say, okay, I don't know what I want. And you kind of question, start questioning everything. I just want to be content. That's right. And what it. does that mean? And what does, it, what well, does I, that mean for I, you? I don't know, but... Uh, it means that I, I'm comfortable with where I'm at right now. And, and like you said, like five, like if you ask me today, what do I want? I want my two girls to grow up, to be healthy. I want my wife and kids to be happy. You know, I want my business to do well. But if you had asked me that four years ago, it was like, I didn't have kids yet. Um, and so I could have never made that happen. But the one thing that, you know, especially like if you read the Bible and a lot of these philosophies is. Really, all we want to do is be comfortable in the moment. Um, that's when, if you look back on your most joyful of times, is when you've just been content with where you're at, whether that's with friends, you know, shooting the shit, whether that's sitting on the side of a river fishing by yourself. Like the best moments are when you're not distracted by like what else you're either not doing or could be doing. You're just like, here I am. And I'm happy with what's happening right now in this moment. And to stay yeah. in that state, like, is it's impossible. Uh, but, you know. Yeah, that, it, it, it's... It is and not so, like the whole uh, Buddhist monk thing. That's why those people can sit in those temples for, like, years and years is they're constantly reinforcing, like, I'm cool with where I'm at right now. Like, I don't need to be out of here. I don't need possessions. I just am happy in this exact moment. Right. Well, and, and the, the, the root for devil, um, is the same root for desire. And it's a, uh, there's a reason that it's, that they have the same root. And so the, the more you can rid your life of, of just, uh, more and more things and desires are like, you know, 20 headed Hydra. As soon as you get that one thing, then you want that other thing. And, and I don't have this figured out. I still want things. I, I, um, Specifically, I'm like trying to hold off on this one purchase of a. Uh, we've had we have like an eight year old car, and I really want <laughs> a uh, a Tesla just to. Um, Dude, you'll be for this is the one thing you can cheat on. You will be happier if you get a Tesla. Yeah, exactly, and it's <laughs> I, it's just I know that's so not true. I really want it for the uh, the auto drive um, feature for the highways here in in LA. So there's somewhat of a pragmatic reason I used to want. A car because of uh, the signal. Now I'm like, oh geez, this is going to look like uh, just you know someone may you know whatever made a, a financial windfall and buys something like my neighbor. He's the most here in LA. He's such an awesome guy, um, and he's a co-founder of of um, a really cool movie studio. But he's so just wears pajamas every day, has a ten year old car. 
And I'm like, uh, I actually, it's like a negative signal because I respect him so much to get a nice car. The, um, but that's, that desire is there, but I, what's nice about holding it there, it's the only thing that I'm like, man, that would be cool. Um, there isn't a vacation. There isn't a, a thing that, I guess I want to get better at surfing. That's a desire. But in terms of thing, I used to have five things at all times that, man, I can't wait to get this. But uh, this Tesla probably won it for a year, could buy it, but in pushing it off because it's nice to almost just say that's a single pointed desire that I'll see him all the time here and be like, oh, that'd be freaking pretty cool. And one day down the road, but I get to kind of keep that, that uh, 20 headed Hydra with one head. But I know that as soon as I get that, as soon as that that happens, I set like a revenue target for my side project uh, in my magic mind before I get one. And I, and I just know whenever that that head is befelled and I cut it off, I'm going to be satisfied for about 48 hours. And then there's going to be three other desires that pop up uh, on the other side of it. So I do not have this stuff figured out, but there is something uh, infinitely uh, wise about realizing the root word of devil is the same root word of, of desire. And I, you know what I would tell you, you're already winning because you're going into the purchase already with a clear head is like, I've just thought about this enough to be like, look, it's not wrong to want something. It's, it's stupid to think that by getting something all of a sudden, like your life will be better. Right. But look, if you just get a Tesla and you're like, look, I'm going to buy it. It's not going to make me any happier. It's not going to make me any worse. I just think it's cool and I like it. That's cool. But if you go into it as like, God, when I get this, I'm going to like, if you were singles, like I'm going to get so many chicks or like, I'm just, this is going to be the best thing ever. It's like, there is nothing on the planet that you could be given that like 24 hours after getting it, you would be as happy as even when you got it. I mean, it literally happens in like a matter of seconds. I feel like, like Christmas right. is the perfect example. It's like you open the gift and then you're like, thanks for getting me this. And then it <laughs> right. all fades yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, you know, my biggest desire is peace of mind. And so I, I know, uh, that, that it's also just don't, don't take on a, uh, a bad habit of purchasing things that, that you fast forward five other desires after that. And I might be in a place where, uh, we're not financially okay. And, and then I'm like, oh shit, now I've accidentally, I was, I was in a good spot and now, uh, I'm in the red and, and that is, that's my worst nightmare. Um, and, and that is something that, you know, it really can, it really can. I'll, I'll tell you the story of this, this awesome surfer, this guy, John, John Florence he's the best surfer in the world. And he wins the championship, um, the second t- two time back to back years for the second time, and he's interviewed and he's asked. Um, so, John, John, what does it feel like to win your back to back first back to back World Surf League Championship? And this guy's such a badass. He just looks at the uh, person asking that question. You know, he's just gotten off of the uh, the uh, the water where it was announced that he won, and he looks the interviewer in the eye and goes, "Nothing changes. I've been surfing since I was three years old." Um, He's, he was maybe 26 at the time. I'm 26 now. I love surfing. I'm, I'm looking forward to surfing tomorrow. He's just stone cold, has a response that is the most baller response to that question that I have ever heard. Nothing changes. And that is a, um, that's the place that if I have a desire, it's to get to that point. And when we were talking about that fidelity moment where there's these um, zeros in a bank account, it was, it, there was this real recognition of um, nothing changes. And partially because I knew that story and I aspired to, to be at that place, but uh, partially because I love creating things, whether it's um, a book or music or a company or uh, this conversation, creating connection. That's what I love. And, and I'm going to do that. I've been doing that since I was drawing when I was little. And I hope to do that until the day that I die of creating. And, um, and that's, you know, what, what I really deep down desires the ability to create and, 
and kind of maybe unfettered creation to where I can check some financial boxes to be able to you know, feel like I can go in some liberated directions. But, um, but that is, that is uh, when, you know, when it comes to external pursuits, that's the, that's the response. Yep. And not that you or I like, look, I have plenty of ambitions and I'm going to make a million mistakes. And I don't sit here today on this podcast saying I have any of it figured out. Some of it's just becoming aware, but, you know, just something kind of interesting that I think about a lot. I read a book called Living Life Backwards. If you just kind of like ask yourself the question on certain things, like it, it, regarding that Tesla, is like, is this something that when I'm on my deathbed one day, which one day you will be on your deathbed. It might not be for a long time, but hell, it could be tomorrow. We never know. Am I going to be happier? Like, and I'm reflecting on my life. Will this purchase or this thing be something that I am talking about in the last 24 hours of my life? The answer could be like, fuck no, no way. That's okay. At least you framed it for yourself in the moment that like, this will not be important to me down the road. And I categorize it that way. Whereas uh, I could spend the money on the Tesla or I could spend the money, you know, having my daughter go to a private school that might lift her up in her life. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. there are certain things that you'll do that are very obvious that, yes, with 24 hours left to live, I will be so glad and I would be happy to share this experience. And then there's things it's like, this ain't going to matter. It's it's. That reading the book's a little sobering because what you realize is like 99% of stuff that we do on a day-to-day basis like ultimately isn't something you're going to want to talk about on your deathbed. doesn't make it wrong. It just makes the things that do matter matter even more and they become more apparent. Right. Yeah. It's, it is, uh, we're so hypnotized by these illusions of what we think is important. That's, that's what I love about uh, Vedanta is, is that is and and. Christianity, by the way, every philosophy, uh, therapy, um, every you know, every religion, philosophy, or therapy are essentially just how to avoid self sabotage. And I think that that's that is uh, we're always on the precipice of. I know that I'm always on the precipice of self sabotage. So how do I avoid that? And um, and I think that that's one of the great things about creating and creation in general is that you really start to question everything. You especially, you know, it's kind of like, who's better off? The person that uh, gets what they want or the person that doesn't get what they want. And, and I think maybe in a, some vein, you could say it's, it's a, the, the, the person that doesn't get what they want, you know, learns, but, and, and we really lift up uh, the, the poorest of the poor um, kind of philosophically in our culture, um, and, and the nobility that can, you know, that can be inherent in, in having nothing, but there's something really gratifying on the wisdom scale to get what you want and realize, oh, this ain't it. And, and this isn't what I really want. And if you do that enough, yeah, it's very healthy. And I think creating is, is, is one of those things where you reach these milestones and do you, um, you either get fatigued by reaching these milestones for external validation, or you get energized by, wow, okay, I'm doing this for me. This is, this is, uh, I'm hitting this milestone and I get the gratification of learning a new skill or a craft or getting better at something. And that is, you start to pull on these threads of questioning your motives for other things. And you start to question your, you know, hypnotic, we're all hypnotized by you should want this and that, and this is a complete life. And, and I think uh, picking away at that, starting to question it, that is um, the beginning of realizing realizing uh, what's illusory and what's total bullshit um, and what is really and worth valuing. It's total bullshit. Dude, it is. It's, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's, it really, really is. So much of it is. All right. So to wrap this thing up, Everybody on the planet is becoming aware of a app called Clubhouse, audio first kind of social network, which has been fascinating. And because you and I are podcasters, we probably appreciate it even more. Uh, you happen to be one of the first one to three checks. We still aren't sure which one it could have been, but we'll we'll be humble and say it was the third check. 
uh, just like walk us through that experience. I mean, you're, you've you become, we ha- we didn't touch on it today, you become a prolific angel investor, um, which I, I, you know, I get to pinch myself sometimes that we get to invest together, but talk about Clubhouse, how you got in, and um, we'll wrap it up there. Well, there's no real right place to start on that story. Uh, the the only one that that really comes to mind is you convincing me. Talk about questioning um, what you're seeing. You made me question whether I should. My, I thought I shouldn't be investing in other startups. I need to focus on my own. And maybe that could have could have had um, it could have improved the odds. But it was I learned so much from investing in other companies. You know, Buffett. You mentioned Munger, so I'll drop a. A Buffett uh, ism in that he's a better businessman by being an investor and a better investor by being a businessman. And you got that train started. So that's that's where it really started. And then fast forward seven years and um, I'm invested in maybe 50 or 60 businesses at this point. And uh, Paul Davidson, the the founder, CEO, co-founder of Clubhouse, um, just reaches out and said, you, James, you were friends. And so he said, I'm starting my next thing. And I, uh, you talk a lot about podcasting and, and the value of audio and uh, AirPods being uh, you know, a, a game-changing technological shift for us to be able to uh, listen to podcasts and audio at home and yada, yada. So he reaches out because I had been talking about it and I had already invested in a handful of businesses and and the area that I help founders with is, is fundraising. And so they were gearing up for a fundraise and I said, happy to help you fundraise and I would like to write a check. And that really was based on him as a founder. And I think I thought audio as a space was was definitely interesting, but it was totally just knowing him for five years and and wanting to make a bet on he had a similar story to Tilt that he had taken a high profile company far, didn't end up being what he ultimately wanted it to be. Um, and uh, and in, I just knew he he was going to be all the smarter for it. And that was it. And so in the whole exchange was a few phone or one phone call. Oh, you're going to start another company. Okay, awesome. I would like to invest. And um, there's no like due diligence. There's no studying the space. I didn't even know about the competitors. I learned about a competitor like three weeks later of a friend of mine being like, um, or once they launched three weeks in, I was like telling friends, you should try this. This app, it actually started a company. It was an app called Talk Show first. And then they um, pivoted to Clubhouse. And a friend was like, you should check, dude, it's, that looks a lot like Road Trip. But Road Trip, you can add in music and, and listen to it. And I was like, shit, okay, I didn't really do my diligence on the space. But I was comfortable with just making the bet on Paul and he had figured out uh, he is one of the survival of the fittest type of founders that I just figured he's so adaptable. He's going to adapt into something potentially special and portfolio theory. Well, you know, you create the right portfolio. You're okay with it. It going to zero. So um, thought about all of those uh, those things in the first few weeks, had no idea it was going to become what it's become. And uh, and yeah, like 13 months later, 100x uh, my money on that check. And that is outrageous. <laughs> um, and it's uh, that, but it, but it's it's just so much of it is, I barely knew what I was, I knew enough to be comfortable uh, doing it, but it was, um, it's impossible to describe. I don't know enough to say this is exactly how it happened. And I will not spin a yarn of bullshit of, like here is here is my key insight. Um, it, it just it didn't it didn't happen with some key insight. I'll add one thing to it, and then we'll bring this thing home. But it is what we talked about when we started. This is when you have millions of these little interactions in life, and these tiny little moments that you don't even realize are adding up in your brain. When you see something that makes sense, you can act on it quick. But if somebody asks you to explain why you act on something it's not always an easy response. Like, yes, you can give the generic business school answer. That's great. But some things in life are just all these tiny little things adding up. And when you see it, you just pull the trigger. 
Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the fact that you're forced to explain some scientific methodology for how something happened, it's just not how the world actually works. Um, so, right, right. It's, it's so true. And it's, uh, you know, lives are made on, on the other side of 12 seconds of, of courage. I might just add that it was, um, I have apprehension in every investment that I make, um, had apprehension about that one, uh, but it really is just getting more and more comfortable with, okay, this is the sport. This is what it is like, uh, whether it's, you know, jumping on a wave and not knowing how it's going to go down or just knowing the numbers that you jump on enough, uh, some will pan out and, um, and that ultimately comes from just sticking with a a craft or a you know a, a zip code in which you're working in and you're building in and you build up that that muscle memory. It's not from listening to a podcast and hearing some piece of insight. It's not from uh, reading a book. It's it's from doing and and to exactly what you just said. You do it long enough, and then you look back and some inflection point happened on a Tuesday in in December of twenty. 18 for a clubhouse that that might uh financially set me up for the rest of my life and it will have nothing to have done with what I planned for that week that quarter that year it was an agendaless call to uh that I didn't even know was going to help a a founder fundraise um but uh but that's often how these uh as 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 you and I both know these these were it's ran it's all about random Tuesdays and seizing a moment um, that comes across, you know, your desk that you could have easily said, "Ah, oh, just going to let it pass." And and I will end it by saying, look, if the only bet you were ever going to make in your life was on Clubhouse, then yes, it was a huge risk that you were taking. And Matt, and all luck, and all luck, and that's and why I actually luck. I used I used to say, "Oh, it's all luck." I don't say that anymore. It's not, um, but. But it is 75% luck, but it was 25% taking shot after shot after Be- shot. Because for years. angel investing isn't about going 100 for 100. It's about going like two or three or four for 100. And so if, if you're consistently placing bets and you're consistently going through the process, the great thing about angel investing and venture is one or two wins out of 100 bets could make you returns that could change your life. So it's risky when it's your only bet of a lifetime. It's not risky when it's one of 50 that you made that year. Um, we're not trying to go 50 for 50. Especially if you've got five years of, and really before that, I'd started two other companies. So you know, if you have seven, eight years of, of scars of doing it wrong, then it's, um, like we said earlier, it, it can set you up for, for uh, you know, foundation for future things going right. Yep. All right, Bob. All right, Chris. Thanks so much for okay. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast, buddy. Can't wait for you to come back on mine. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right, later, Chris. Hey, everyone. It's Chris here again. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Leave a five star rating or write a quick review. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next episode. Chris Powers is the founder and CEO of Fort Capital LP. All opinions from Chris and guests of the Fort podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Fort Capital LP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for real estate or investment decisions. The Fort with Chris Powers is produced by Straight Up Podcasts.